In 2021, I uploaded a video entitled, Seven of the Most Horrifying Animal Attacks, where, as the title suggests, I talked about seven cases of animals attacking and, in some cases, killing humans. For quite some time since then, I've wanted to make a video about animals that actually save lives instead of trying and or succeeding in killing people. You know, animals that actually helped people instead of trying to rip their faces off. Not all animals want to kill us, and you'd be surprised how many people owe their lives to animals. And in this video, I'm going to talk about eight of them. Here are eight of the most heroic animals. Pigeons are probably the last animals you'd expect to be heroic. No doubt you see them every day if you live in a city, and they have a reputation for not being the cleanest animals, with their most famous nickname being flying rats. In the past, however, pigeons played a big role in war times, as they were used to relay messages between soldiers. One such pigeon was Cher Ami, whose name meant dear friend in French, and you'll soon see why they named him that. He was a homing pigeon, which were typically used in racing due to their speed, and later found themselves being used in the First World War as messengers. Originally owned by the British Army, he was donated to the US Army's Signal Corps when they joined the war and made their way to Europe. Homing pigeons had a very dangerous job, as they would be deployed in the middle of the battlefield, and German soldiers knew that they were carrying vital intel and would always focus fire on the pigeons if they happened to see one. On October 3, 1918, in the closing days of the war, the American 77th Division found themselves under heavy fire behind enemy lines. Unfortunately, being behind enemy lines also led to them being attacked by their own comrades who thought they were German soldiers. At first, the division tried to send runners to their allies to ask for backup and also to request that they stop firing at them. However, the German forces were keeping a lookout for any runners who might be attempting to go for help and either gunned them down or captured them. The US forces left with no other options, began sending homing pigeons to deliver a message asking for aid. But the first two pigeons they sent were also shot down. Things only got worse for the US forces when they once again came under friendly fire from the other US battalion, who didn't know that they were firing on their own comrades. In one last attempt to call for aid, the US forces released their last surviving homing pigeon, Cherami. Unlike the other pigeons, Cherami was not immediately gunned down and managed to take off despite the heavy barrage of shells surrounding him. However, the German forces managed to spot him as he took off and began firing on him, and he was shot. He crashed to the ground in the middle of no man's land as the fight continued around him. Jeremy was not killed by the bullet, but had been severely injured. One of his legs had been almost completely blown off. He had lost one of his eyes, and he had a large hole blown in his torso. Miraculously, however, Jeremy managed to get back up and once again take off. This time, the Germans were not able to shoot him down, and Cherami, through sheer willpower, managed to make it to the US home base and deliver the message. This is made even more impressive when you realize that the home base was 40 kilometers away, and he made it there in 25 minutes. Thanks to Cherami, the friendly fire was called off, and the rest of the US forces were able to rescue the 77th Division, though the majority of them had sadly been killed by the time they were finally rescued. Cherami was treated by army medics and was given an artificial wooden leg to replace the one he lost. For his part in saving the 77th Division, Cherami was awarded the Croix de Guerre, one of France's highest military honors for his gallantry in the field. General John Pershing, commander of the American Expeditionary Force, said, There is nothing the United States can do too much for this bird. Cherami died on June 13, 1919, at only one year old. His body was donated to the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., where it's still on display to this day. In 2019, 100 years after his death, he was awarded the Animals in War and Peace Medal for bravery. It's so hard to believe that a pigeon of all animals could have become a hero that saved 200 people. Just think how many families, and maybe even you watching right now, wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that brave little pigeon. Shall I tell you a little story? Go on. Um, when you think of the heroes of uh, previous wars, um, World War One, who do you think of? What, as in an individual? Just think of an image. Oh, well, you think of someone in the trenches, don't you? That's, a, that's an image I'm going to change one of the images in your heads, um, because I'm going to put a pigeon in there for you. Listen to this, right? Um, so, 194 soldiers were trapped um, and almost 600 Americans, including Le Lieutenant James Leake, 
got cut off from comrades during a major offensive on German positions in 1918. Now, these were men of the 1st Battalion, 308th Infantry Regiment. They were surrounded deep in a French forest. They were shelled by the enemy, as well as taking friendly fire hits. Now, nearly 200 of them died. Runners tried to get messages out. They couldn't. They failed. Then the group sent carrier pigeons out. Only these carrier pigeons were shot out of the sky. But there was one, one British homing bird called Cher Army. This bird flew 25 miles in 25 minutes to deliver a note. And it was shot in the breast, it was blinded in one eye, and one leg was hanging just by a tendon. Anyway, all of but this... But survived for a period of time afterwards. It survived, and all of this has been documented um, in, in various archives of letters, and they're now being put on sale at Bonhams. But it's the story that I'm interested in. Also, what was lovely about Cher Ami, who survived her injuries, she did lose her leg, but then a small wooden one was carved for her, and she survived. Really? For, she lived for another year. And was it, is it Cher Ami as in dear friend? Is it the French? Yeah. There you go. While cats are probably our second closest companion animals, you all know what the closest is and you'll see plenty of them later on. They aren't known for their bravery. If anything, cats are known for being quite skittish and jumpy, hence where the term scaredy cat comes from. However, sometimes cats are capable of performing great acts of bravery, particularly when it comes to protecting their kittens. And one cat named Scarlet showed just how far she was willing to go to save her baby's lives. In 1996, Scarlet was a one-year-old cat who, for one reason or another, had found herself living on the streets of East New York. At some point, she'd had an encounter with a male cat and gotten pregnant with what would be five kittens. Needing somewhere dry and warm to have her kittens, she found herself a disused garage to call home while she raised them. This garage was actually part of a crack house, and the people who used it either didn't mind or care about Scarlet's presence there, or they simply weren't aware she was there. Eventually, she had her kittens and got settled into the garage with them. Unfortunately, this peace and quiet would be short-lived. On March 30th, 1996, two weeks after the kittens were born, a fire broke out and quickly engulfed the garage. The fire department was called and began tackling the fire. One of the firefighters, David Gianelli, happened to see something remarkable. Scarlett had carried each of her kittens out of the burning garage one by one, she had been badly burned while saving her kittens. Her eyes were blistered shut, her ears and paws burned, and her coat was highly singed. The majority of her facial hair had also been burned away. As she couldn't see the kittens, she nudged all of them with her nose to make sure they were all there. She then collapsed onto the street and lost consciousness. I said to the lieutenant, I said, I told him I heard kittens crying. As soon as I got off the fire truck, I heard some kittens crying. So, I looked around in the smoke and I found three kittens right to the right side of the garage door. Still huddled up together, you know, afraid, crying in a lot of pain. When Dave found two more of the mixed breed kittens, he assumed that their mother had left her litter behind to fend for themselves. But a few minutes later, Dave found the badly burned calico mother cat nearby and realized that she had risked her life to save her babies. This mother cat was in bad shape. She, she her face was uh, um, burnt. So I, I bent down, I picked her up real, you know, nice and easy like, and I held her close to me like this. And uh, I started to get like emotional a little bit, you know, and I said, I can't do this. This is, you know, I gotta take care of this cat. David Gianelli gathered Scarlett and her kittens into a box and took them to a local veterinary clinic. They were treated for burns and smoke inhalation and placed in an oxygen chamber in intensive care. It was during her time in the animal hospital that Scarlett received her name, partly because of the red patches of skin that were visible through her charred fur, but also because her heroic act of saving her kittens reminded the vets of the actions of Scarlett O'Hara saving her family in the film Gone with the Wind. The vets were able to successfully treat Scarlett's injuries with them having to surgically replace one of her eyelids that's been gravely damaged in the fire. Scarlett and her kittens spent three months in intensive care, with one of them, a white kitten named Toasty, sadly dying from a virus a month after being rescued. Upon Scarlett's story making the news, the veterinary clinic apparently received thousands of offers to rehome her and her kittens from around the world. The four remaining kittens were rehomed in pairs, with two going to a home in Port Washington, 
and the others go into Long Island, Scarlett went to live with Brooklyn-based writer Karen Wellen. Karen's own elderly cat had recently died, and she wanted to take in an animal with special needs. Despite needing medicated eye cream three times a day, Scarlett otherwise recovered well and enjoyed excellent health. Karen Wellen said, I expected to see a scrawny, hairless cat, but she was gorgeous. To honor Scarlett for her bravery, the North Shore Animal Shelter created the Scarlett Award for Animal Heroism to be presented to animals that take part in actions that benefit humans or other animals. She also received a certificate for bravery and a plaque from the RSPCA which read, Animal Plaque for Intelligence and Courage is awarded to Scarlett in recognition of her actions when her kittens were trapped in a burning garage in Brooklyn, USA on the 29th of March, 1996. She also received many ribbons and awards. Karen Wellen collected these as well as citations and press photos of Scarlett and added them to her Scarlet Wall. Despite Scarlett's fame and notoriety, Karen Wellen eventually opted to let her cat enjoy a quiet and peaceful life away from the press and the two would live happily with each other for the next 12 years. In 2008, Scarlett's health began to decline as she had developed a heart murmur as well as problems with her teeth leading to her having difficulty chewing and eating, which led to problems with her kidneys. After her health became worse, with her eventually not being able to stand up anymore, Karen made the decision to have Scarlett put to sleep at the age of 13. Following her death, tribute was paid to her in Times Square, with her image being displayed for 24 hours on the Reuters screen. Tribute was also paid to her by the North Shore Animal League of America, with them saying, She was not only a dedicated mother, fearless heroine, and a beloved pet, but she was also an inspiration to us all. Scarlett's five kittens were not the only lives she saved in her lifetime. Her celebrity saved countless animals at the Animal League and all over the world, shedding light on the intelligent, intuitive, and loving nature of cats. Her face regally adorns the pages of the League's life-saving sponsor program, as she represents all the special needs felines in our care. Scarlett impacted all who knew her and touched the lives of countless people around the world. There will never be another Scarlett, but though she is physically gone from our lives, she will never be forgotten. Scarlett's heroism and bravery in the face of a situation that should have killed her and all of her kittens made her an icon for heroic animals everywhere. Though she and her kittens are now all long gone, people around America still remember her to this day for her incredible courage, showing that she was certainly no scaredy cat. One of the most amazing adoptions ever happened to Scarlett, a very brave cat. This is Scarlett. She's a beautiful, beautiful calico cat. She looks a little different from most calicos because she was badly burned in a fire. Scarlett lived on the streets. She didn't have a home. She'd found a garage, made a home for her babies, and the garage caught fire. She went in and saved each of her kittens one at a time. She pulled each one out, and each time she went into this garage, she got more badly burned. And if a very nice fireman hadn't saved her and brought her to the North Shore Animal League, she wouldn't be here with us today. And we're very lucky that we have her. She spent three months in the hospital recuperating. I wanted Scarlett because I was in a very bad car accident and it left me with a little bit of a problem when I walked. And I thought I wanted a cat like myself who wasn't quite perfect anymore. The North Shore Animal League received so many letters and phone calls from people all over the world wanting to adopt her. And my letter was chosen. I couldn't believe it. It was better than winning the lottery. <laughs> it was better than winning a million dollars. Nothing, nothing could compare to winning this beautiful cat. And I think she wants to eat breakfast with us. Whoops. <laughs> Do you like that? That's your favorite. That's tuna. I think that cats who've gone through, and dogs who've gone through difficult times become more loving and make great pets. Life with Scarlet is so much fun. When we first got her, she was a skinny little cat. You could see by her profile, she's not skinny anymore. She gets lots of food, lots of love. <laughs> We're always playing and running around and jumping and in the middle of the night, sometimes, she'll jump on top of me and say, let's play. I love to feed her from my hand. I love the feel of her tongue against the palm of my hand. I love you. I love you. The thing she likes the most is tissue paper. 
She loves to jump in it, hunt for toys that are buried underneath it. It's my favorite thing to do with Scarlet, is to hug her and kiss her. Yeah, you're the best. You're the best. She makes me happy, I make her happy. I think she's the most beautiful cat in the world. She saved her babies. She's a hero. Yet another type of cat, though these ones are of course much bigger than Scarlet. Lions are known as the king of the jungle and are actually seen as a symbol of courage and strength due to the male lion's huge size and majestic appearance. That said, lions do not like humans, seeing us as intruders whenever we enter their territory, be it in the wild or captivity. Lions are of course extremely dangerous if angered. A full-grown lion, be it male or female, could easily kill a grown man with little effort due to their huge teeth and claws and strong bodies. A man would have little hope of fighting off a 400 pound male lion. So since I've made it rather clear that a lion would rather kill us than help us, why am I even talking about them here? Well it turns out there is at least one case of lions coming to the aid of a human, and this took place in Ethiopia in 2005. An unnamed 12 year old girl was on her way home from school, but as she walked down the road, four men appeared and grabbed her. She attempted to scream for help and break free from their grasp, but this unfortunately failed and she was thrown into the van which then sped off from the scene. They took her into the jungle and for the next week, they abused her physically and mentally because they intended to force her into marriage. After a week, the men attempted to move her from the house they had been keeping her in. Once again, the girl did the only thing she could do in that situation, scream for help. Unlike last time, however, her cries did not go unheard. Three male lions who happened to be passing by heard the screams and out of curiosity went to investigate. When the lions came across the kidnappers, they immediately charged at them. The men dropped the girl and ran for their lives. She had been left at the mercy of the three lions, most likely believing there was no chance of surviving at this point. Something happened though that neither the girl nor anyone else would ever expect. The three lions formed a circle around the girl, seemingly protecting her from harm, as if they knew there was a chance the kidnappers may come back. The girl most likely couldn't believe what she was witnessing, as these were lions, the apex predators of the African grasslands, who could easily kill her with little to no effort. But instead, for whatever reason, the big cats decided to protect the girl and did so for several hours. Eventually, the police, who had apparently received a tip-off about the men holding the girl there, arrived to rescue her, at which point the lions scattered and disappeared into the forest. Naturally, everyone was puzzled as to why the lions didn't kill the girl after chasing off her kidnappers. Some experts believed that because the girl was crying after being attacked, the lions may have mistaken the noise for that of a lion cub, thus making them decide against killing her. The police were later able to track down the kidnappers and arrest them, bringing the incident to a conclusive end. After word spread of what had happened, local people believed that the lions were spirits sent by God to save the girl. There are many people who don't believe that this event even happened, since it seems far too out there that a lion would ever save a human's life. But if it did happen, then that young girl owes a huge debt to those lions. If they hadn't come when they did, the girl would have most likely been sold off into marriage and would never have seen her family again. Pigs are yet another animal that you wouldn't expect to be heroic. Sure, Babe was the hero of his stories, but those are of course fictional. In real life, pigs are, rather unfairly, seen as dirty, fat and lazy. Many people believe they lie around all day wallowing in their own filth and only get up to eat. In reality, pigs dislike living in dirty enclosures and will often attempt to clean up any litter or discarded items. And the only reason they roll in mud is because it moisturizes their skin, keeps parasites away and also acts as sunblocker on hot days. They're also known to be among the most intelligent of all animals, being capable of having object location memory, whereby if they find food in one spot, they'll remember to look there next time. They've also been known to be able to solve complex puzzles and have even been observed playing video games. Despite this, pigs are sadly doomed to die on most farms, since they're only really used for meat since, unlike cows, their milk probably isn't very appetizing and they don't have wool on their bodies that can be shaved off and sold like sheep. Some pigs, however, are lucky enough to be taken in as pets and get to live a life free from worrying about being sent to the slaughterhouse. 
One of those pigs was Lulu. Lulu was a Vietnamese pot-bellied pig born in 1998. She was purchased as a piglet by Jack and Joanne Oldsman as a gift for their daughter Jackie. Several weeks after receiving the pig, Jackie gave her to her parents when she had to travel out of town and never actually went back for Lulu. Jack and Joe quickly grew fond of Lulu and she became a member of the family, being their second pet alongside their dog, Bear. In August 1998, Joe, Jack and their two pets headed for a vacation in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania at their mobile home at Lake Erie. Little did they know that one of them would go through a truly harrowing experience on their trip. On August 4th, Jack left the home at 5am to go fishing. Joanne woke up two hours later and went to the kitchen to make breakfast. As she walked to the kitchen, she felt lightheaded and dizzy. Before she knew it, she felt a massive pain in her chest and was soon writhing on the floor in agony and began crying for help. As Jack had gone fishing and there was no phone in the house, Joanne threw an alarm clock through the window, hoping it would get someone's attention. The family dog, Bear, began barking, but did not leave the bed, as he most likely did not realize what was happening. But the only thing Bear was saving was his strength. He never left the bed, and his barking did nothing to summon help. And I had to face facts I was probably going to die. But before she did, she was in for one more surprise. Suddenly, Lulu appeared over Joanne, and unlike Bear, actually figured out that Joanne was in great peril. She then exited the house through a dog door and ran into the road, lying down in an attempt to stop the traffic. Unfortunately, no one would stop. Lulu went back into the house every time someone drove past to check on Joanne, who was gradually slipping away due to her heart attack. She'd then go back through the dog door, which scraped against her belly so much that it caused it to bleed, and go back to lying in the road. Finally, when one driver saw Lulu lying on the road and bleeding, he stopped and went to see what was wrong. Lulu then got up and led the man back to the house. The man knocked on the door to let Joanne know that Lulu was hurt. Joanne then cried out that she was having a heart attack and asked the man to call 911. The man rushed to the nearest phone and called the hospital, and within minutes, An ambulance arrived and took Joanne to the hospital. Lulu continued to watch as they loaded Joanne into the ambulance and apparently even climbed in as if insisting that she go to the hospital with her. Joanne made a full recovery from her heart attack, but she regretted that she never learned the name of the man who called for the ambulance. Lulu became a local hero in the Altman's neighborhood, with many people coming to feed the hero pig most days. Sadly, Lulu would pass away in 2003, five years after saving Joanne ironically from a heart attack, and Joanne would also pass away 10 years later in 2013. The doctor had told Joanne that if she'd gone another 15 minutes without help, she would not have survived her heart attack. She said she believed that God had sent Lulu to them, that it was fate they had bought the pig that would save her life. Who would have thought that the animal that would save Joanne Altman's life would be a brave and clever pig who was originally just left with the family to look after her for a while? Starting off the dogs part of our list is Babu. Babu was a Shih Tzu dog owned by Tami Akanuma, and the two lived together in the coastal city of Miyako, Japan. Unlike most dogs, Babu apparently was not fond of going for walks, either because she was getting on in years, or maybe just because she was lazy. This most likely didn't bother Akanuma too much though, since she was also getting on in years at 83 years old. That said, Akanuma did take Babu for one short walk at least once a day, and did this until March 11, 2011. On that day, an earthquake struck the coast of Japan, and Babu, sensing something was wrong, suddenly began circling the room and scratching at the door to go out for her walk. Akanuma was surprised, since it was much earlier than when they normally go out for a walk, but she eventually gave in and went out with Babu. The two would normally go for a walk through the streets, but this time, Babu began pulling Akanuma towards the nearby hills the opposite direction from their normal route. For reasons she couldn't explain, Akanuma somehow had a feeling that there was a reason that Babu was leading her up the hill and decided to go along with her. Babu led her right to the top and while Akanuma was no doubt exhausted from making the long trick from home, she would soon learn exactly why Babu had dragged her there. Immediately after reaching the top, Akanuma turned round to see a huge wave sweeping through Miyako, destroying her home and everything else in its path. Miyako had been hit by a huge tsunami caused by the massive 9.1 magnitude Tohoku earthquake. Babu had sensed that the tsunami was coming 
and took Akanuma up the hill to save both of their lives. Babu knew she had to get Akanuma and herself out of the house, and she did so the only way she knew how, by bugging her owner to take her for a walk. There's unfortunately no information on Babu and Tami Akamura after the event, but as Babu was already 12 years old in 2011, she'll definitely have passed away by now, but thanks to her quick thinking and persistence, she survived the tsunami and will have been able to spend the remaining years of her life living happily with her owner. Instead of focusing on one dog for this segment, I'll be covering several, all of which performed great acts of bravery during this harrowing event. You've all heard of the tragedy that took place on a certain day in September 2001. I can't go too much into detail about the event itself because this video will be demonetized if I do, but it has gone down as the darkest day in American history. Emergency services had never been working so hard to save the lives of those in danger, but they weren't the only heroes that day, as some of our canine friends also found themselves saving lives. The first dog we'll look at is Salty, a yellow Labrador who worked as a guide dog for Omar Riviera. Riviera had gone blind 14 years before due to glaucoma, but continued to work at the Port Authority of New York in New Jersey as a senior systems designer. He took Salty on as his guide dog in 1999, and the two quickly became friends as they were of course together all day every day, and naturally, Salty would accompany him to work at his office on the 71st floor of Tower 1 of the World Trade Center. Salty and I, we started our day very early because I needed to prepare for a meeting. So I got to the Trade Center early, like around 7. We grabbed my elevator, go to the 44th floor, and then switch and go all the way up to the 71st floor. Salty was very obedient, so he didn't even need to be tied down. On September 11th, 2001, Salty was resting on the floor next to Riviera's desk, like every other day. However, at 8.46 a.m., the two of them suddenly heard a terrible booming noise and felt the building sway. Riviera then smelled smoke and heard his computer fall off his desk. I really got very scared because there were only a couple of people who knew that I was there. Salty was running back and forth, absolutely alert. We used to be instructed that you should stay in your place wait for announcements, so I started hesitate. Should I stay, should I go? But then he came back and he just sit next to me, completely anxious. I realized he's telling me something. I have to get out of here. It was at this point the two began making their way out of the office. Riviera, however, believed that there was no way he was going to make it out alive, as his lack of sight hindered his movement. He released Salty from his harness and told him to run, hoping that the dog would at least have a chance of survival without him. Salty did as Riviera asked, but immediately after, he came back, refusing to leave his friend to die. He was telling me, I am with you, no matter what, I am with you. You and I, together, and that's no question. Don't even ask me. Don't even send me back. I'm gonna be with you. Realizing that Salty was going to save him or die trying, Riviera put him back on his harness and began following the dog down 70 floors of the tower. Despite the chaos, Salty navigated Riviera around people and debris as though it was just another normal day on the job. After an hour and 15 minutes, Salty successfully guided Riviera down from the 71st floor and into the lobby. From there, they made their way toward the doors and ran they were just two or three blocks away when they heard the tower collapse, meaning they had gotten out just in time. Even today when I hear there are ambulances or the fire trucks, I get a little anxious. And Salty was the same way. Even he himself developed some kind of fear after 9-11. Salty worked for me for 10 years and uh, in March 2008, uh, we didn't have a choice but to put him to sleep. I started working with this guy, but Salty would remain in my heart forever. Kaidi and I prepare such beautiful dogs. Maybe one day it will be another Salty for somebody else, but I hope not for the same purpose of taking people out of terrible things like the destruction of the World Trade Center. Believe it or not, Salty was not the only hero guide dog that day. Just a few floors above Riviera and Salty was another yellow Labrador named Russell, who 
acted as a guide dog for Michael Hickson, who worked on the 78th floor of Tower 1. Just like Salty, Rossell was sleeping by Michael's desk while he worked, when they felt the same massive impact that Salty and Riviera experienced just a few floors down. Before making his way out, Michael made sure his co-workers all made it out first and called his wife to let her know what was happening. Following this, the two began making the long journey down the tower. The fumes and dust from the smoke filling the tower quickly began taking their toll on Rossell, but she pushed on and after an hour, the two finally made it out of the tower and Rossell managed to get a drink of water from a fire hydrant as they were leaving the area. Just moments after they escaped, the second tower collapsed. Michael Higson also wasn't the only person Rossell saved that day, as the two came across a woman in the subway who had been blinded by debris and helped her get to safety. Rossell's story made the news, which actually led to her and Michael Higson being interviewed by Larry King. And you just followed him down the stairs, followed her down the stairs. Right. We, we worked together and, and I know that we helped others go down the stairs and Rossell had a chance to flirt with some of the firemen as, as we were going down the mm -hmm. stairs because as they came up, um, they would ask me if I were okay. Roselle gave lots of kisses and, and I know that some of them petted Roselle. So she was, always this calm? When she's in harness, she does a good job. I asked guide dogs for a dog that would focus uh, and they did a good job of giving me one. What happened when you got to the ground? We went to a parking lot across from Two World Trade Center but before we got there the building collapsed so we literally turned and ran for our lives and ran into a subway station to avoid some of the dust cloud. By that time we had inhaled a lot. How did you not run into things? Roselle. Uh, strictly uh, following Roselle, again I told Roselle to go forward. Uh, when we got to the end of a building I could hear that we were at the end of the building. I knew that we were at a street corner. I told her to go right because that was away from the Trade Center. She turned and we went and there were a lot of people running with us and around us. So it was kind of a, a crowd mentality. For their bravery, Salty and Roselle were awarded the Dickin Medal on March 5, 2002 for, quote, remaining loyally at the side of their blind owners, courageously leading them down more than 70 floors of the World Trade Center and to a place of safety following the terrorist attack on New York on September 11, 2001. The term man's best friend definitely applies to these dogs, as just like any human, they refuse to leave their best friends behind and risk their own lives to get them to safety. The final dog we'll be looking at in this segment is Brittany. She was a golden retriever who served as a search and rescue dog following the attack. She apparently spent 10 days going through the wreckage with the New York Fire Department alongside her handler, Denise Collis, working 12-hour shifts. Brittany became a sort of therapy dog at the scene, as responders would often pet her and share their personal stories with Denise Collis. They spoke of the loved ones, friends and family they were searching for. Just for a few moments, they found some comfort and strength in Brittany. She continued serving as a rescue dog for eight years after 9-11 and was present in the rescue efforts after hurricanes Rita, Katrina and Ivan. She worked until she was nine years old, at which point she was quietly retired. Following this, she was used as a reading dog in elementary schools in Texas, where students who were usually too shy to read out loud would feel more comfortable knowing Brittany was there to lend an ear. She is believed to have been the last surviving rescue dog from 9-11. In 2016, at the age of 16, Brittany began suffering from kidney failure and her health was declining rapidly. On June 6th of that year, the decision was made to put Brittany to sleep. As she was being walked into the vets, members of the Cypress, Texas Fire Department and rescue workers stood on both sides of the path leading to the vets and saluted her and did so again when her body was brought out and she was covered with an American flag just as a human rescue worker would be. In September 2017, a statue of Brittany was unveiled in Cypress, Texas, further honoring the deceased hero. These are just three of hundreds of dogs who played their part in saving the lives of those in peril during and after the 9-11 attack. These dogs really do prove why our canine companions truly deserve the title, Man's Best Friend. We're returning to World War I with this entry, and this time we're looking at the only dog in United States history to hold a military rank. Stubby was a mixed breed dog that was born sometime in 1916. In 1917, he was found wandering the grounds of Yale University, observing members of the 102nd Infantry of the United States Army who were training there. The soldiers didn't seem to mind his presence, but one of them, 25-year-old Corporal James Robert Conroy, began interacting with the young dog and the two developed a bond. It was here that Stubby received his name, 
which Conroy gave him after noticing his short stubby tail. Conroy took Stubby in as his own pet and had him stay in the 102nd Infantry's camp. Pets were not actually allowed in the camp, but Stubby helped keep the soldiers' morale high and he more or less became their mascot. While there, the soldiers trained him to salute with his right front paw and also taught him to memorize bugle calls and marching routines. When the time came for the 102nd Infantry to join the war in Europe, Corporal Conroy hit Stubby on the ship so the two wouldn't be separated and because he believed that after going through training, Stubby had earned himself an honorary position. Naturally, the other soldiers were happy that Stubby would be making the trip with them, and all was well until their commanding officer discovered that there was a dog on board the ship. Dogs, of course, were not permitted on the ship, and it was likely that the entire unit would be punished for bringing one aboard, were it not for some quick thinking from Stubby himself. As if sensing that he was in the presence of his owner's superior, Stubby raised his right paw and saluted, the officer was actually impressed by the dog's show of respect that his men had taught him to do. He decided to allow Stubby to stay with the 102nd Division and the dog would join them once they made it to France. They finally arrived on February 8, 1918 and were sent straight to the front lines with Stubby joining them. The division was hit by constant enemy fire. It was here where Stubby was caught in a mustard gas attack and was hospitalized alongside the soldiers. Stubby being exposed to the gas would end up having an unexpected effect on him that in time would also become invaluable to his comrades. After inhaling the gas, Stubby memorized the smell, meaning he was now able to sense it long before the soldiers could. On one morning, not long after Stubby was released from the hospital, the German soldiers launched another gas attack while most of the soldiers were still asleep. Stubby smelled the gas and knew everyone was in danger. He began barking to warn the soldiers who were able to put on their gas masks before inhaling too much of the gas, saving their lives. After this, the soldiers realized there was a lot more to Stubby than meets the eye, and they began training him to perform other acts to aid the war effort. They trained him to move between trenches to find wounded soldiers, and also taught him to tell the difference between English and German speakers so that he'd know which soldiers to signal help for. There was also one occasion where a German spy was attempting to map out the trenches of the Allied forces, to look for weaknesses. When Stubby came across him, he called out to the dog in German. Stubby, of course, knew that the enemy spoke German, and he was able to alert the American soldiers who arrested the spy. It was this act that resulted in Stubby becoming Sergeant Stubby, the only dog to receive that rank in the history of the United States military. Funnily enough, this means that he now outranked his own owner, who was, of course, still a corporal. Stubby served in 17 battles, and though he sustained several injuries, he recovered from all of them. Despite being a sergeant, Stubby still had to be smuggled home to the United States because dogs still weren't allowed on the ship. Word spread of the hero canine sergeant very quickly upon his return, however, and he was awarded over a dozen medals for his service in the war, with President Woodrow Wilson himself being present on at least one occasion to see Stubby receive his award. Soon after, Corporal Conroy and Sergeant Stubby moved to Georgetown while Conroy studied law. Stubby became the mascot for the Georgetown football team. He would entertain the fans at halftime by rolling the ball around the field, and this is considered to be one of the very first halftime shows. In 1926, at the age of 10 years old, Stubby died in his sleep. Conroy had the dog taxidermied, and 30 years later, donated Stubby's body, as well as his famous coat, adorned with all of his medals, to the National Museum of American History, where, alongside Jeremy, he is still on display to this day. James Robert Conroy died in 1987 at the age of 95. He had lived long enough to see himself become a great-grandfather. It's crazy to think that he may very well have owed his long life to that friendly little stray dog who he'd met by chance in the field at Yale University all those years before. Just like Jeremy, there's no telling how many families owe their very existence to the brave Sergeant Stubby. When I decided to make this video, I knew the one animal who had to be on this list was Balto. In America, when most people hear the term heroic animal, Balto is very likely to be the first thing they think of. Some of you may have heard of him thanks to the 90s animated Universal movie that was loosely based on his story, which also received a Dingo Pictures ripoff movie sometime later. Oh, 
Balta was a Siberian husky born in 1919 in Nome, Alaska. He belonged to famed Norwegian dog breeder Leonard Sipala, the man often credited with having introduced the husky dog breed to Alaska. Balto was actually considered to be a scrub dog in that he was believed to be too large for mushing and Sipala even had him neutered as he thought Balto was quote, too inferior to pass on his genes. In short, Sipala saw Balto as a dud. Balto would, however, find someone who saw some potential in him Gunnar Carson, a Norwegian prospector who'd moved to Alaska in search of gold, rented some of Sapala's dogs to transport supplies to his men who were working in the gold mines. Of all of Sapala's dogs, Carson chose Balto to be the lead dog pulling his sled. Many believe that Carson felt some kind of connection with Balto and chose him because he knew he could trust him. That said, even Carson wasn't foreseen just how special Balto would turn out to be. In 1924, Nome would be hit by one of its worst winters on record with temperatures plummeting to as low as minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit and terrible blizzards that forced the people of Nome to stay in their homes and sit by the fireplaces just to stay alive. That same month, a large percentage of the town's children became sick with what the doctor believed to be a sore throat. The doctor told their parents that the children would be fine with just a little rest and told them to take them home and nurse them back to health. Two weeks later, in January 1925, two children died. At this point, the town's only doctor, Curtis Welch, realized that the children were not suffering from sore throats, and the town had been hit by the deadly and highly contagious disease, diphtheria, and it had spread throughout most of the town. The children could do nothing as they slowly lost the ability to breathe and swallow. An immediate quarantine was announced by Dr. Welch in an attempt to stop a full-blown epidemic. The cure for diphtheria had already been found not long before this outbreak, but Noam did not have the means to treat an outbreak of this size. On January 22nd, Dr. Welch sent out word to the other doctors around Alaska and even the White House requesting aid. Everyone replied back saying they could supply enough vaccines to Nome, but the extreme weather conditions made it impossible for them to reach there. Scott Bone, Alaska's territorial governor, announced a plan that would involve the best mushers available to travel to checkpoints where they would deliver the serum to each other until the delivery eventually made its way back to Nome. Naturally, Gunnar Carson volunteered to be one of the mushers taking part in the serum run, as he travelled along the trail leading to one of the checkpoints many times with Balto. Unlike the rest of the mushers who specialised in sled racing, Carson only used his dogs to transport supplies to the gold mines, so speed was not one of his strengths. As such, he was assigned to one of the easier trails. During Carson's run, a huge storm hit and word was sent out to all of the checkpoints that the serum run had to be postponed due to the dangerous weather. Carson, however, was already in the middle of the frozen Alaskan wilderness and had all of the vaccine with him. With no way of knowing that the serum run had been called off and nowhere to take shelter, Carson had no choice but to continue on. Eventually, the storm caused a whiteout and Carson lost all visibility. He stopped and huddled together with Balto and the other dogs for two hours, hoping the storm would pass. He eventually realized, however, that he didn't have time to stop, as every moment he spent waiting for the storm to pass, another child could be dying in Nome. His only hope to get through the storm was Balto. It was now up to him to guide the other sled dogs through the storm and onto the next checkpoint. When they finally arrived at the next checkpoint, at a town called Port Safety, they found that the next musher and his dogs had fallen asleep due to it being the middle of the night and the run being cancelled. With 12 miles left to go to Nome, Carson realized it was up to him and his dogs to complete the serum run. They finally arrived at 5.30 in the morning. Carson rushed straight to Dr. Welch with a vaccine. Dr. Welch was able to administer the vaccine to every affected child in Nome, and they would all go on to make a full recovery. Following the serum run, Carson and Balto became instant celebrities, with people from all over America wanting to meet Balto in particular. When Carson and Balto traveled to the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles after having been invited there for an interview, even movie stars of the time were rushing to meet Balto and have their pictures taken with him. The two were even asked by Paramount Pictures to appear in the film Balto's Race to Nome, though this movie no longer exists due to a studio fire in 1930 that destroyed every copy of it and many other films. The two toured America and it was in New York where Balto would be immortalized in the form of a brass statue in Central Park that still stands today, with a plaque that reads, dedicated to the indomitable spirit of the sled dogs that relayed antitoxins 600 miles over ice across treacherous waters 
through Arctic blizzards. From Nanana to the relief of the stricken gnome in the winter of 1925, endurance, fidelity, intelligence. Balto unfortunately did not have a happy life following this tour, as Leonard Sipala, the man who originally bred Balto and believed him to be a dud, still technically owned him, and had sold him and the rest of the dogs that Carson used to Sam Houston, owner of a dime museum in Los Angeles. The dogs were treated terribly at the museum, as they were chained to the walls all day, never got any exercise, were rarely fed, and most eventually became sick with mange. In 1927, a man named George Kimball from Cleveland, Ohio, visited the museum and was shocked to find Balto there. He returned to Cleveland and began spreading word of the mistreatment that Balto and his fellow sled dogs were being put through. A campaign was started to buy Balto from the museum, and within 10 days, they had raised enough money to not only save Balto, but also the rest of the sled dogs. The dogs were given a hero's welcome as 15,000 people lined the streets of Cleveland, giving a standing ovation. The city of Cleveland raised money to have a massive enclosure built for the dogs at the zoo, where they would have their own field with enough room to roam free and play. Balto would live at the zoo for the next six years until he became very ill and was put to sleep on March 13, 1933, at the age of 14. The entire nation mourned his death, and the city of Cleveland had him taxidermied and put his body on display in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, where it still remains to this day. In the years since Balto's death, another dog in the serum run, named Togo, has also been getting more recognition, as he and Leonard Sapala actually traveled the most dangerous part of the run. While Togo does deserve to be recognized as a hero alongside Balto, Sapala ruined any chance of this happening for decades due to his petty and bitter action of selling Balto and the rest of the dogs used by Gunnar Carson in an attempt to basically get rid of them. In trying to make himself a hero, he inadvertently made himself the villain in the story. Despite Sapala's efforts, Balto has gone down in history as an American hero. If it wasn't for the brave efforts of both Balto and Gunnar Carson, the serum would have never made it to Nome and thousands of children would have died. I think we can all agree that Balto wasn't just a good boy, he was one of the very best. And that's the end of the video, folks. This is the one that really made me realize that my videos take far too long to come out. So I finally made the decision to hire an editor. I posted about looking for one in my community tab and got an email from someone who's actually edited for another YouTuber who makes similar content to me and has proof of it so I know they're not lying about their experience. And I thought, yes, please be my editor because I need someone who's way better than me. Hopefully from now on, videos won't take two months to come out. I'm definitely aiming to get more than six videos out this year, so I guess we'll see if that happens. And don't worry, for the next video, we'll be returning to our regular programming of stuff about people dying and so on. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.